Last week, Attorney General Merrick Garland gave a speech to a Fed convention in D.C. in which he insisted that Justice Department employees are actually victims of you, the American citizen, for all the hurtful things you say about them. Over the past three and a half years, there has been an escalation of attacks on the Justice Department's career lawyers, agents, and other personnel that go far beyond scrutiny, criticism, and legitimate and necessary oversight of our work. These attacks have come in the form of conspiracy theories, dangerous falsehoods, efforts to bully and intimidate career public servants by repeatedly and publicly singling them out, and threats of actual violence. What are the threats of actual violence? Unspecified. But hey, speaking of actual violence... If you don't fill out your gun paperwork correctly, he'll come kill you. Or if your Facebook posts are too heated, he'll come kill you for that, too. Oh, but those guys pointed guns. Yeah, well, such things are to be expected when you go door kicking at sunrise instead of, I don't know, how about just talking to the old disabled man or to the guy you could have otherwise very easily spoken to at the gun-free airport where he works running the place, which you know because you've been surveilling him, including at that airport, for months. So it's very ironic for Merrick Garland to complain about mean tweets as potentially linked to violence when he responds to such things with actual violence, or in today's story, with at least the intimidation of the possibility of it from federal law enforcement agents. Which is what happened here. A guy made a spicy post about Merrick Garland's boss, or deputy boss, and yes, as we'll get to, it is red hot spicy, but for that, FBI agents made a visit to his home on Monday. Jeremy Kaufman is an entrepreneur behind the Odyssey video platform and other projects, He's a libertarian activist formerly in leadership with the Free State Project effort to get libertarians and freedom-minded people to move to New Hampshire, and he's involved in leadership with the State Libertarian Party as well. In the last few weeks, I've wondered how to handle myself if the feds pay me a visit regarding certain recent events in my life. So far, that hasn't happened. I've only received an email and expressed my intent not to accept their invitation for an FBI date night. But if the FBI does ask me out again, well, now there's proper demonstration for how to handle it, and I hope I can do it exactly as Jeremy Kaufman did. Whether you agree with what prompted this visit or not, I certainly think this country would be a better place if federal agents were not feared, and instead were treated with exactly the firmness and mockery that they were in this case. Merrick Garland's feelings be damned. Kaufman asked the agents to identify themselves. We get only one last name from one of them. Hey, Jeremy? Yeah. How are you? Here we are. I made Joe O'Donnell with the FBI. Can you give your full name, please? I made Joe O'Donnell with the FBI. Is that sufficient to identify as the only one O'Donnell affiliated with the FBI? Mm -hmm. Kaufman wisely recorded the entire encounter, which is his right, despite the request that he not. Could you please state your full name, sir? Could you please stop recording? No. It's First Amendment right. Okay. What's your name, sir? Could you stop recording? Please? Absolutely not. Very polite of them. If only the FBI would honor that same request themselves. Hey, FBI, could you please stop recording? No, of course not. They'll record every damn piece of your life if they decide they want to. But the agents continue with the buddy tactic. Hey, man, we just want to talk to you. After all, couldn't you use a friend? All I want to do is talk to you about a post that was made. And if you well, happen to be the one that made the post. I want to talk to you about you guys coming here. At that point, Kaufman starts ripping them for wasting public resources to investigate something they know is not just legal, but constitutionally protected. Now, I know some are disputing that claim of constitutional protection, but as we'll get to, they're wrong. Say you make a salary of, I don't know what, low 100K? You guys making six figures? Factor in 50% expenses, overhead, maybe 100% expenses. I'm talking about burning a couple hundred dollars an hour just here, let alone all the time you guys are spending to investigate something that you know is not against the law. Ah, oh, but we're not saying it's against the law, man. Like we said, we're just here for a friendly chat. You know, we could 
talk about the game while we drink a beer. So you, you're familiar with... Is, so then why would sure. you come? Because we wanted want to make sure that there weren't any... No, you're threats. coming because you're, you're, you're part of a regime that does this kind of thing when you know laws aren't being broken. Now notice, those two statements are largely in conflict. Oh, we're not saying there was any crime here, but also we're just here to make sure that there aren't any other threats. Well, that presupposes that there was a threat in the first place, which would be a criminal matter to investigate. And that gives away the intent. The intent, of course, is not just some sit down with the bros. The intent, even if they know that there is no legal prosecution to be had here, is to intimidate you out of what is your constitutional right. So now that we've reached that understanding, it is outright mockery time. And this is the stuff I'm talking about. With absolutely no apology to Merrick Garland and company whatsoever, Listening to this makes me feel like Mel Gibson charging in the Patriot. Didn't you guys read the Constitution? Do you not believe in America? Sir, like, how do you do your you jobs and go home? We appreciate it. <laughs> You're walking away. Because nothing we did is against the law, and you guys are fuckheads that try to act like bullies. And I hope you go home and are embarrassed. You can't even say your name on camera because you know that what you're doing is embarrassing. You know Americans that believe in the Constitution think you're laughable. And you go home and you think about what you did today. Go home and think about it, you coward. I love the approach of out nannying the nanny state. Oh, you came here to put me in a timeout? No way, mom. You're going in a timeout. And you're going to think about what you've done. In fact, you're going to bed without dinner tonight. Just kidding. They eat filet mignon every night while you count pennies for Cheerios. Now, of course, skeptics and critics will accuse me of burying the lead, of ignoring the other side of the story. I'm not. To me, regardless of the circumstances, laughing in the face of your neighborhood fed is always the story insofar as it is a necessary return to our country's founding spirit. But yeah, there is a reason why the feds made their visit. It appears that Kaufman made a pretty spicy post about Kamala Harris on Sunday. After the news of the second Trump assassination attempt broke, the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire account posted, and I'll have to be careful here so that YouTube doesn't misunderstand the context, anyone who uh, removes Kamala Harris would be an American hero. That tweet has now been deleted as a violation of X rules. And on his personal account, Kaufman posted, it's weird that no one ever tries to remove the actual president. Isn't that the guy in charge of everything? But it's highly likely it's that first tweet from the party account that caused the visit. One, it's the more aggressive of the two with an endorsement of certain actions of removal. Two, Kaufman reportedly runs that party account, although to my knowledge, he is not admitted to posting the tweet in question. And three, the FBI agents have some question or uncertainty about whether he posted the tweet. It would be more certain if the tweet was from his personal account. And at least on X, that piece of the story has now flipped a lot of opinions. Oh, he posted a threat. Oh, he posted a call to violence. He endorsed crime, and therefore the post is criminally suspect, if not an outright crime itself. But it actually isn't, though. Kaufman is absolutely correct to say that his post is constitutionally protected speech. Now, we can call it distasteful. We can call it immoral. We can call it unwise or even reckless in the current context of political assassination attempts. But the one thing we cannot call it is a crime, at least as far as the Supreme Court's First Amendment case law is concerned. The speech in this case, and any law enforcement against it, falls under the Supreme Court's incitement doctrine, or the Brandenburg test established in the 1969 decision of Brandenburg v. Ohio, in which the Supreme Court protected the speech of a KKK leader who endorsed or forecasted violence generally. In deciding that case, the Supreme Court said that speech encouraging lawless action can only be prohibited or criminalized if it meets two specific criteria. It must be directed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and it must be likely to incite or produce such an action. So it has to call for the action, and the action has to be likely to happen imminently. And that is distinct from just saying it would be good if the action happened. Expressing an opinion that criminal activity in general is good is absolutely protected speech because it is a viewpoint. 
It's a value judgment. Now, it might be a bad value judgment, but the constitutional principle is that we the people make those value judgments, not the government at gunpoint. Well, what do you mean? He was clearly advocating that someone remove Kamala Harris at the earliest possible convenience, some are arguing. Okay, if you think this tweet is not constitutionally protected speech, consider the specifics of the Brandenburg case, because the facts are closely related. In the Brandenburg case, Clarence Brandenburg, the KKK guy, said, among other supposedly illegal things in his speech, if our president, our Congress, and our Supreme Court continue to suppress the white Caucasian race, well, there might have to be some revengeance taken. I'll always remember this case, not just for its First Amendment significance, but because of that great word, revengeance. Revenge and vengeance combined, just like Lenny and Carl mused about. That's nothing like revenge for getting back at people. I don't know. Vengeance is pretty good. But why choose? It's not either or. When you're really mad, it's both, as Clarence Brandenburg knew. For any doubt that violent revenge is what Brandenburg meant, that's what the definition of revengeance is. A furious act of revenge to use violence to attain peace. So Brandenburg was saying that the use of violence generally in pursuit of a larger good would be good, just as Kaufman did in this case. And the Supreme Court held explicitly in the Brandenburg decision that mere advocacy of crime in general is absolutely constitutionally protected speech. The decision was unanimous. If Brandenburg was constitutionally protected, then so is Kaufman, since the reference to violence is nearly identical. Both statements say, I think it would be good in the general sense. Now, of course, the constitutional protection of speech does not mean that the speech is good or wise or even valuable. Necessarily, it just means not illegal. It means not criminalizable. Now, to the extent you may disagree with the speech or view it as outright wrong, or maybe even believe it should be illegal, In deciding how to handle it, we have two possible risks to consider. On which side would you rather err, in other words? Too much speech for your kooky neighbor, or too much power for federal agents to go get your kooky neighbor, and probably you next. It's not just a question of your safety. It's a question of the truth itself, because after all, how do we find the truth? Do we find the truth through a free and open opinion and information exchange and a battle of those ideas? Or do we find the truth at the muzzle of a federal gun? Now, you may not consider this particular opinion to be valuable or to contain any elements of truth. But the point is, every inch of federal creep into that arena is another inch of room lost for the people to find the truth and the good ideas for themselves. The cost of too much speech freedom for your neighbor may mean that he acts upon his crazy words someday, sure, but there are constitutional remedies for self-defense in that scenario that could and should be taken more seriously, too. The cost of too much power for the federal government with information control, however, is the truth itself. Lose that? and lose everything. And the trick in that consideration is that just like the truth itself, the federal government doesn't provide you with safety anyway. You think the feds are going to protect you from your kooky neighbor? That's hilarious. Who do you think your kooky neighbor is working for is the far more relevant question. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on X that is at M. L. Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are live on Wednesday and Sunday nights. Looking forward to it. Come on.